Well, good morning. How is it that the gospel message sometimes feels and gets to, f- to be so complicated? <clears throat> we can look at different things in the gospel message and recognize that there are um, different elements that we need to view. But the thing that I think that we miss sometimes is the fact that it's simple. It's easy. There's good news in the gospel message. We define certain things and we hear certain words like grace and mercy, redemption, that you have to be clean in sinlessness. But I see all of that and view it through the fact that God loves us, as you will always hear me say. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. But I want to look at a scripture in Romans because Romans will stop and it will it will look at the idea of love from a point of view that we don't normally pick up, that we don't normally stop to say, yes, I see exactly what love has the capacity to give us. So if you'll join me in turning to Romans 13 and verse 10, we'll start out with this passage. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Love does no harm to a neighbor. How are we doing with that? Now, if the neighbor brings pies and cakes over, if the neighbor is someone who waves and says good things, it's easy to say, I love this neighbor and I can love this neighbor. But what if me and the neighbor have issues? What if me and the neighbor have a fight over the fence or the dogs or the way that I park my cars in the yard or the paint that I put on it? What then? What happens then? Do we love each other or do we get into a battle? Do we find ourselves in argument, in giving bad vibes off to each other? You know, it's interesting when we get caught in those situations. We can get caught in those situations everywhere, though. How many people out here on the highways and on the roads run into situations where someone's made a movement, someone's cut you off, someone hasn't gone when the light turned green, somebody didn't realize what a hurry you were in and went five miles under the posted speed limit the entire trip and you could never pass. How are you doing? Do you stay behind them loving? Well, here's the end, part B of this. Therefore, in verse 10... Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Well, boy, that certainly doesn't sound like what I hear in, most of the time in, in services, that love is not doing any harm, and love itself is fulfilling the law. Therefore, Jesus Christ, when he came in love, fulfilled the law. The law pointed to the fact that we could not keep it. The law points to the fact that we need a Savior. The law shows us that without Jesus Christ, we can't do anything. So love fulfills the law. Love covers all of the commands that we receive. Jesus Christ said that the greatest commands were loving God and loving your neighbor. So now let's go to the scripture that shows us the gospel message, the scripture that lets us know exactly what that love looks like. If you will turn with me to Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 and verse 1, we start out that we are made alive in Christ. We were made alive through the love that God and Jesus showed through the cross that he came to be on and through to his eventual ascension and, uh, and promised to us that there was something after life. In verse 1, as for you, as for me, you, you were dead. I was dead in my transgressions and sins because we all know that everyone falls short. In verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. Is there anything that we've read in these first three verses 
that make us feel like they aren't describing what life used to be before we knew our Savior, before we knew who Jesus Christ was, before Jesus came and, and, and called and drew and knocked on our heart to say, you know, there's something different. Because I can certainly recall the times of gratifying cravings. Some people would look to try to define it, try to give it some kind of definition as to how that looked, you know. Some would even say, well, I wasn't even that bad. How can you say that, you know, I gratified, I was a good person, I made good choices. Uh, I think sometimes we have, we have a difficulty not viewing our own sin. Because I can definitely look in my life and see those things that I'm doing right. Well, look, I'm doing this right, and I'm doing that right, and, and this sin over here isn't difficult for me, and therefore I'm a good person. But if we stop to recognize where our sinful natures are, and all of us have different sin issues, we can't judge anybody because we recognize that we are all part of this first three verses. We are all sinners. So we gratified the cravings of our flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. We deserved what sin was going to give us. We deserved the punishment of sin. In verse 4, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. God made us alive before we ever had an idea of who he was. While we were still sinners, while we still lived in all the filth and the mire that our lives consisted of, God made us alive with Christ while we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. There is nothing that you have done, nothing that you have done that has given you salvation. It is an undeserved gift. It is grace that you have been saved. In verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ. When God took us into his bosom, when God had Jesus Christ on the cross, we were then raised to heavenly places. Now, I know as we live here on earth, as we walk our daily lives, we don't recall that God has already done it. He raised us up with Jesus Christ. We get stuck in what's happening around us, not recognizing the promise, not recognizing that it is done. In verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. That he might show the incomparable riches. And this is where we get to understand that what God has done, there's no comparison to. And when we as humans try to express and explain what God has done through what we understand, we sometimes fall so short of exactly what it is that's got, that God has done. Even now, as I try to explain the passage, I do not give it enough glory to fully express what God has done. I do the best I can through how I've lived and what I know. But it's incomparable riches that he has done, that he has given us through his grace. We didn't deserve it, but as a loving father, he wanted to give it to us. Expressed in the kindness for us in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we receive it all. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we wouldn't be able to receive any of God's gifts to us. <clears throat> for it is by grace that you have been saved. 
not because of anything we have done, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Here's what I think the gospel message needs to continually let and remind us about. It is not from yourselves. Now, as Christians, as we walk with Jesus, as he lives his life through us and in us, do we not see change? Do we not see that some of the sin that we committed change? But as we hear Paul talk about in Romans, he's still making choices that aren't the choices he wants to make. For I do the things that I don't want to do. My mind says I should be doing this and I still make choices that I really feel I shouldn't. And that's where we find ourselves in our daily walk. Are we not continuing to make choices that as we look back at them, go, man, I can't believe I did that again. I can't believe that that upset me, that that created that reaction. Because it's like hitting your thumb with a hammer. Sometimes it's a reaction. Sometimes it's not thought out. Sometimes it's a nature of who we are that gives us that response to whatever has gone on in, in front of us. You know, I don't think there's anybody here who can drive on the roads who can make it from point A to point B without having some of their Christianity checked. You know, it just... It just it's one of those things that gets me. I have a difficult time when you get in areas where you have people who are selfish about how they drive the roads and how they are uh, able to, to get in front of you and to cut you off. But here we see that even though we cannot live it, that even though we have a difficulty with our sinful nature, that it's not through my works. It's not by the things that I do. It is a gift from God. In verse 9, not by works so that no one can boast. Why would God and Jesus want us not to boast? Why would we need to be able to say it was on him? Because if we had any area that we could say we accomplished what God had set out, that we could live our lives right, that we would be able to say it was us. And therefore, we didn't need anything that God did. You know, the law in the Old Testament was written to prove to us that we couldn't do it on our own. The law in the Old Testament, as we watch the Israelites try to continue to keep them, and as we read through all the prophets, and as we read through all the history, and we see that they could never keep the law of the covenant. A law that would allow them the blessings of God, a law that would allow them to be able to uh, receive God's special anointing on a group of people. All you have to do is keep these commands. All you have to do is set yourself apart. And throughout history, we had moments, as Isra or the Israelites had moments, where they kept the law and they received the blessing. But for the most part, the books show us that they didn't keep the law, that they had a problem keeping the law, that the temptations of not keeping the law were greater. So, now we have issue. Now Israel goes into captivity. Now Israel wonders why God has abandoned them. So history then shows us that we have no capacity to do what God has done. So no one can boast. Jesus Christ came and he was the final sacrifice. He paid the price so that no one could boast. In verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now I know that some people don't believe that we were created to do good works. But as we read in Genesis, we were created in the image of God. We were created to be a part of the family. We were created to be in relationship with Him. And if we are in relationship with a God who in His own nature does good and good works, then 
We were created in Jesus to do good works. How are we doing? How are we doing when someone takes advantage of you? When someone steals from you? When someone hurts you or a family member? When you lose a job, when you know for certain there was somebody else in the company who definitely could have been removed from it in a way that uh, would have benefited the company, and yet here it is, it's on you. It's unjustified. It's unfair. How can you tell me I've lost my job? Especially in a time when jobs are so hard to find. Jim over here isn't doing his job. He sits down and I have to cover his work and yet you're letting me go. How can you do that to my family member? You took advantage of somebody who didn't understood. It's just not <clears throat> what I would expect to see. And therefore my love, my good works isn't seen because I'm mad. So look. See what happens. We can see right now in some of the protests going on around the country that it starts out with one idea and by the time everybody else gets a hold of it, we, we see something else. And good works isn't necessarily what it's all about. And we see, we see human nature being a part of it. So as we read on to the end here, for we were created in, for we are God's handiwork created in Jesus Christ to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Did you all realize that you were prepared in advance to do good works? Now, as Christians, I'm certain you all might have some understanding that that is what God had prepared for you, but does your neighbor know that they were created, that you're fighting with the one who doesn't know about Christ? Did they know they were prepared in advance for us to do good works prepared in advance? Before now, there's something God gave that allowed us to be able to be a part of that love, that allowed us to be a part of what he decided so long ago with his son. If we read in Ephesians 1 and verse 4, it said that it was before the foundations of the world. He knew us before the foundations of the world. The preparation in advance was so far advanced, we can't even comprehend how that would work and how that does work. But realize this, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, they love us. Jesus came to the cross for that love, to pay that final price in love and through love. That through his ascension, we, could, we have the promise of eternal life. He showed us the way. He showed us it could be done. He didn't say, I'm going to show you later. There was proof at the moment. And then, through everything done, we are a part of and included in God's family. Well, hallelujah, that is a message that is wonderful. It's a scripture passage here that just expresses it in a way that we can't deny. We're not going to boast it was through Jesus Christ. I did want to stop and I, I wanted to pray just for a minute. You know, I've on the way in here to the radio station, I was listening to the radio and I heard that here in the state of Texas, we have five cities that within the next little bit have the chance of running out of water. And we know that we've gone through such a drought and that is just a, a uncontrollable event. And only God can change those things. And, and there's one city that maybe within the next month might have to have water shipped in. And, and I feel that uh, it's just something we need to pray about. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, I pause here to be bringing up and lifting up 
<clears throat> all kinds of di different situations. You know, here this week, we, we pray about the persecuted church, Father, and I want to lift them up before your throne as somebody who enjoys the freedoms here in America, that you might be with those who are dealing with persecution, that you might bless and give them grace and mercy, Father, that they might continue to reach out to those people who are lost and need to hear the great news of your Son and how he came for us even before we even recognized who he was. Please bless Bless them and give them the courage and the energy. Continue to take, give them the growth, Father, and protection that they need. Father, I ask you to be with the people who are uh, dealing with the drought conditions here, Father, that you could uh, give them the rain. We have stopped as a group, as, as a people here in Texas to pray for rain. And thank you for Rick Perry and, and having him come together with the idea of us praying as a community. But we need to continue to have more rain. And even, even what the predictions of rainfall are saying will still be short, but only through us seeking your face can we find what we need, Father, that you will provide the rain in due season, that you can help these cities who are saying they're about to run out of water. You can give them that water, that you have the capacity to control the, the rain in the seasons, Father. And so I ask for your mercy and grace to be extended, for that is who you are and of your nature. We might not be fully deserving, but you can provide for us as, as we go through the different things that we go through. Father, also this week, I just want to thank you for the veterans. I want to thank you for those people who have stepped up and have served this country, Father, who have laid their life down to be able to allow me and others the privilege of being American to be a part of this great country. Will you please bless the veterans, Father, and please give them the peace and mercy and grace that you've extended to us and that we might be able to continue to show our thankfulness for all that they've done. Father, I am just always in amazement of who and what you are and how you deal with us as we learn and grow. Will you continue, Father, to teach us? Will you continue, Father, to hold us in your merciful hands? Will you continue to direct us down your paths? Father, I pray that as Christians, as people in the community, knowing who your son is, that we might be able to be an example, that we might be able to reach out with the love that you reached out with that we might be able to express and touch those people in a way that they know that they're loved. May we show that more than we show anything else, Father. May we be able to express what you are for rather than what you are against. May we be able to show that they are welcome in the fold and a part of the family and that it was paid for before that day, before today. At the foundations of the world, you had them all considered. In Genesis at the fall, you said that your son was coming. We can see way back in the beginning, Father, that you've been there and that you are there. So we just thank you for all that you've given and we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for the rain and we thank you for the blessings. We ask all this in and through the authority of our King, of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen.